Welcome to Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. On Digging Deeper, we have in-depth discussions with extension and industry experts about those important landscape topics. Tonight, we're going to focus on a serious problem with eastern red cedar trees taking over the prairies. Thank you for joining us once again for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. Eastern red cedar trees are really quickly becoming a threat in our pastures, roadsides, and acreages across the state. Tonight, we have a great chance to discuss this important topic with our experts, Dirac Twidwell and PhD student, Dylan Fogarty. So Dirac, Dylan, welcome aboard. Let's talk about something that I know is near and dear to both of your hearts, especially if there's fire, chainsaw, and getting people to tear them out involved. <laughs> well, thanks for having us, big fan of the show. So Excellent. look forward to our conversation today. Excellent. So let's talk, let's start really by talking about why is this a big deal? Eastern red cedar is a native species. You've done a segment on it, um, Dylan, also a segment on Eastern red cedar. It is beloved by people for windbreaks. It is actually, uh, the, the cultivars and the varieties of it have become go-to plants in the landscape industry because they are so tolerant of hot, dry, windy conditions. So what's what's not to like? Yeah, so Eastern Red Cedar really is that double-edged sword. Um, and it's been studied for decades in rangelands as the species has continued to have really a bigger impacts and bigger consequences as it moves from the benefits that are localized, you know, like with wind protection and other things. But as it starts to encroach into areas where people don't want it, uh, that's where we start seeing big impacts. And really, it's all part of a bigger discussion and a national discussion that, uh, that is taking place. Like on these maps uh, there, you, we, we kind of isolate different functional groups. So different rangeland threats are tied to a certain type of functional group of vegetation. So they have cheatgrass problems out west. Well, that's an annual grass. So you can see on that map, there's a lot of blue. Well, that's where cheatgrass is increasing in the Great Basin. But if you look on that map, nowhere is, are things increasing as much as trees into rangelands. And it's not close. In fact, it's over double. So we have a huge national kind of rangeland crisis with woody encroachment. In addition, trees are increasing or decreasing the least. So they're increasing the most, decreasing the least. And really the Great Plains driven by Eastern Red Cedar is notorious as the most problematic native encroaching woody plant taking over rangelands. So yeah, they've had their benefits when our systems are intact. Now it's compromising our broader systems and we're seeing a lot of consequences tied to that. All right, so Dylan, what's your role in all of this since you are a student, which means that you get to be worked to death and have to write papers and <laughs> go tromp around in all the heat. What do you think about all this and what's your role? You know, we've been doing research on, on the, the benefits and the, the, the consequences of encroachment. And so we've been working on the benefits, you know, where the invasions are occurring in Nebraska, um, you know, and really engaging the local community and how to better address this issue. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that, given what we know about this species, um, when we think about planting the species and introducing a seed source on the landscape, we have to consider the potential consequences of encroachment. You know, it's really important to consider when we're using red cedar, given what we know about it now. That, we can lose you know, forage production for livestock. Uh, we lose um, grassland biodiversity. We have impacts to um, uh, water yield. We have potential to lose water yield in some landscapes and we have an increased risk of wildfire too. So, so let's talk a little bit about that whole fire thing and, and what really does happen when ERC goes up in flames, what happens? Yeah, well, uh, we know that really wildfire danger is increasing in the Great Plains. In fact, last decade, we had a big surge uh, with wildfire activity that was unprecedented for our system. And a lot of that's been in the Southern Great Plains. So uh, we've had a, a real buildup of, of what's called volatile fuels. And Eastern Red Cedar is a notorious volatile fuel, and so are other juniper species. So when the right conditions, especially when they're dry, you, you get really hot, very uh, extreme conditions at times. And, and that's playing out. And of course, we often put these uh, 
you know, adjacent to houses or, or you know, nearby in some of our horticultural plantings. And, and of course, if we think back, we didn't have wildfire risk for a long time in the Great Plains. So it's that classic discussion of, here's something we haven't dealt with yet. Why is this going to be a problem? Well, we're seeing it be a problem in other states, just tied to how it changes fires when they occur. And it makes it a, a real challenge. We, fire suppression techniques, they struggle to put out wildfires in those, uh, those dense cedar dominated areas. And we're much more likely to be successful when we keep our rangelands intact. So if we think about eastern red cedar as a landscape plant or on, the ac on acreages or on farmsteads or even residential, because you mentioned you know, cultivars and varieties of them in town, is that a big deal? Why, why would we even, why would we not suggest using junipers or cedars in situations where the ecology or the environment really calls for it? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest ones is that when we're introducing those into our bigger rangeland landscapes, and, and so a lot of people don't know, the Sand Hills of Nebraska is the second largest true prairie in the world in terms of its intactness. So when we're introducing things like cedar that spread and, and have the potential to, to invade into those areas where it wasn't historically, I mean, we're, we're talking about fragmenting one of the most intact remaining grassland systems in the world, and those are incredibly rare. Uh, so one is understanding that that's changing that system and how it's going to function for future generations, and it has those consequences that Dylan was talking about. In cities and everything, it becomes a, a, a more, I guess, a nuanced discussion. Uh, you know, what is it that's in cities that, that might pose an issue? Well, we've got a lot of these remnant landscapes that are remnant prairies that are small around Lincoln and other places, and, and the seed sources that are from more cultivar plantings or around homesteads move into those intact remnant prairies at times. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, it just, how does it change the functioning of some of these urban uh, vegetation pathways. So we're seeing that with a lot of, of different forest species, but in the Southern Great Plains, it's that conversation of, you know, well, we're seeing wildfires that moved through cities for the first time. And, and so can we start to picture that? How, really, how are cedar trees and other things changing how our systems are functioning? How's that happening in the cities? There's very little science on that versus we know a lot about how it's changing our intact grasslands. So the, so the cities, again, let's talk about the cities, because I know, uh, at least in Lincoln, Parks and Rec has, has gone to either no mow in a lot of locations, or low mow, or is beginning to add in those prairie remnants. And a lot of homeowners also, whether it's you know, a tiny little piece in a, in a new development, or driving down 48th Street is an example, there's a new prairie in progress. Well. What I see is little cedars under the oaks or under the canopy of whatever the, the species was that is supposed to be there in the park because, of course, who likes the, who likes the juniper berries? All those creatures, right? Mm -hmm. So what's, what's that impact on, on the long-term uh, long success of what, what is supposed to be there in an urban environment? What do we think about that? You know, when you see those little trees, um, that's a key indicator that you're not going to have that little tract of prairie for very much longer. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you see those trees, it's transitioning to actual uh, eastern red cedar woodland. So um, I think that's the biggest implication is if we want those tracts of prairie um, and we have a bunch of cedar trees coming in, it's going to be increasingly expensive to keep that as a prairie over time as it transitions to a woodland. So how, how do you control them? in an urban environment? Well, what you're hitting on is, is something that we're actually just putting out as kind of these new scientific guidelines for how to better manage cedar for a variety of contexts, including urban. Um, and it's pretty obvious, you have seedlings, well, that, that invasion pathway, what happens next? Well, seedlings become mature reproducing plants that create more seedlings. So it starts, the ball starts rolling down the hill and gets away from you. Well, we want to implement practices before seedlings emerge. And that's what was magical about prescribed fire or magical about fire historically. Uh, conifer trees hate fire because they're so sensitive to fire. It kills those seedlings and it consumes the seed. So it prevents even this whole thing from happening. 
when we change that pathway, if we're going to use other management, we're looking at keeping seedlings in a recruitment trap. We want to prevent them from blowing up, right? So how do you do that? We've, a lot of people do it with loppers. They do it with haying. We don't think of haying as controlling cedar. It does. Uh, anything that keeps seedlings small. Because as soon as you get that mature tree, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of more of new berries and cones being produced, and that starts getting spread. So keep it in that recruitment trap. That's one of the biggest things we know we could do going forward. All right, so if you continue to mow and continue to mow and continue to mow, does that finally kill them in an urban environment or does, does it just become this carpet of little stickery, semi-alive cedars? It's gonna depend on how, really how close to the ground you mow. So I've seen yeah. in parks where they mow frequently, you have a fairly thick stem cedar tree that's this tall, um, but has kind of foliage growing outwards. Yeah. So in that case, you're gonna get a, a lot of stunted cedar trees. Um, in other cases, if you're mowing before, um, or if you're mowing at a low enough height where you're taking off that, that lowest branch, you'll kill the tree. All right. Well, we want to make sure that you're watching us on Facebook and giving us all of your fabulous uh, questions and comments because we really don't want to do this sort of thing if we're not talking about what you want to hear about. So look for us, tell us what you think, and enjoy the rest of our conversation tonight. All right, so in the landscape, let me just pick on Taylor Juniper as an example. Taylor juniper is a naturally occurring, very vertical, very narrow selection of eastern red cedar that was discovered in Taylor, Nebraska, and was initially very, very difficult to propagate. They couldn't graft it, it just, it just wouldn't take. They've now figured that out, so Taylor juniper is, is sort of the juniper version of people who like the, you know, the really narrow Italian cypress in a landscape or along a parking lot screen. Have they started producing cones or seed? Or do we know? Or do some of them produce them and some don't? Or are they hybridizing? I mean, if you think again longer term about what are the issues associated with using these as landscape plants, what are you, what are you seeing now with those? Or, or are you seeing anything yet? I think that's, a, that's an outstanding question because what it also does is it, it frames how we often study problems or challenging questions in nature. So what we're talking about is, is this classical kind of interdisciplinary problem now. So the rangeland ecologists, wildlife ecologists, all those groups tend to think of it as eastern red cedar, and they're focusing on it at that level on big scales, regional issues and consequences. Uh, on the horticultural side of things, we tend to think of it in terms of those questions but often because of the scales, we're framing our question, right? We're looking at it much more local, more narrow. Mm -hmm. We have a huge gap. So I think what you're hitting on there is the gap. And if we understood that gap, you know, we'd have better solutions. So there, there's real opportunities for taking horticultural expertise and some of this, you know, landscape-based ecology expertise and bridging it. Because there's not much that gives you that answer right now. What, what we do know right now with how we see the system is that when we see large, uh, large trees that are encroaching in areas, it, there is something cause driving that seed source. These, mm -hmm. Most of the recruitment's happening within a football field right now of a seed source. Hmm. So, so we, it's strong spatial order of encroachment. It's not just this long distance transport. So it tends to suggest that yeah, there's reproduction happening in some context given the encroachment happening in that part of the sand hills. It's just what's driving it. So uh, maybe our viewers don't understand either the, uh, the difference between male and female because they may say, well, I've never seen cones on any of my cedars or my junipers in my landscape. So talk about that and is there progress possible on that or is it just outrageously expensive? Well, so it is a dioecious species, so we have male trees and female trees. Um, trees with uh, both male and female parts are extremely rare. Um, there's been some work on developing all male trees. Um, it hasn't got to the production point where they're distributing those trees, but it's been ongoing research. 
um, but so far we haven't, there hasn't been anything real promising to say we're going to have, um, be able to, to mass produce all male trees or even identify at a young age which trees are male and distribute those trees. So, Which is again in the plant world, if it, especially if it's a woody species, it, it can take a decade or more before you actually go into reproductive age yep. with those plants. So, so fingers crossed, but we're going to have to come up with something different in terms of either discouraging the use or managing again that that gap between here's what's going on in the landscape world, here's what's going on in the natural world. This is maybe especially true when you think about communities growing outward and, and even, you know, even smaller communities, not just Lincoln and Omaha, which continue to go off into, you know, acreage development or kind of that leapfrog of a new development that is along a trail, as an example. So what do you see or what do you think about in terms of how are you doing that? How are you, how are you working with communities? Let's kind of have that as our last piece of the discussion. Well, communities are critical because that's where the culture exists. So, so when we see the kinds of changes that are playing out across multiple states, and this is one of those conversations, it, it definitely comes back to communities and how communities can band together. It's, you know, you and I have talked multiple times, this is kind of like a bigger version of, you know, of, hey, if you have dandelion problem and you're my neighbor, then so do I. But now think of it on a grand scale. So, so yeah, we're, we're very tightly coupled with making sure that the science that we're learning and these principles we're learning can be put to practice so that we can f start to finally have success on this issue. So, you know, Dylan's been actually doing a lot of that work as part of his PhD where, where he's working as coordinating these kind of producer-oriented efforts in areas like the Sandhills, but it starts trickling into some of these more urban conversations as well. Uh, different values, different interests, but Cedar team seems to affect those as well. And are we optimistic, Dylan, on making, making sure that those that community connection happens as you work on that PhD? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> this is an issue that, this is a solvable issue. Uh, when we look at other trees, um, they re-sprout, they're, they're very difficult to get rid of. Eastern red cedar is a controllable problem. Um, if we can have the cultural will to, to come together and do something about it. And that would be kill it. And prevent it. <laughs> and, and prevent it from overtaking grasslands, absolutely. All right, excellent. Well, that is all the time we have for Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. I wanna say thanks to Jarak and Dylan for coming in and talking with us today. We will be back next week with another in-depth horticulture discussion. And do be sure to watch Backyard Farmer live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central on NET. Thanks for digging deeper with Backyard Farmer.